congregants that forgot to change their clocks. I'm just not even surprised at all. But, like I've heard somebody say, the important ones are here and high out there uh, watching from home. Um, can we start with our call to worship? God is love. God calls us to love. What is love? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love isn't proud. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Love knows. Love endures. Love never fails. Amen. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Klein is with us today. And Dr. Klein, it's really nice to see you here in person. We've, uh, I think I can safely speak for everyone. We've really enjoyed your video service. You do a wonderful job, by the way. Um, let's see. Oh, we're going to do something a little different um, in our worship service today. Uh, we still can't sing. We're not supposed to sing. Uh, but uh, during the offering, we will speak the doxology. Um, other announcements? Really, no announcements. Nothing's going on. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Sal's got one. I just want to say, Dr. Klein, that we have been uh, looking up to you for some time now. Thank you. Okay. Can we have a moment of prayer, please? Father in heaven, maker of heaven and earth, you alone are worthy of our praises. We've gathered together to Raise our voices in praise to you. We thank you for the wonders that you have worked in our lives. Accept our prayers of thanksgiving in Jesus' name. You are the only true living God. Manifest yourself within our midst today. We know that without you, we can do nothing. Empower us to do great things today and every day in Jesus' name. As we finish our Opening prayer for church service, may we feel your power. May each person present be inspired to love and serve you for every moment until we are gathered together again. Amen. Amen. We're going to um, <clears throat> hear a hymn, How Deep the Father's Love, and then Sal Bush will read from the Book of Psalms. reading to you today Psalm 23 and as it's written in the New American Standard Bible uh, it's called new but I've had it since my early 30s so back then the type was a lot easier to read a Psalm of David the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters, and he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then Matthew 22, when uh, Jesus came to the Mount of Olives to speak to the people, 
The Pharisees sent uh, their agitators into the crowd to try and throw him off. And I read, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Thank you, Sal. That was beautifully done. Christ has lifted up our brokenness so that we might see the wounds of the world. In the light of Christ, we can find healing and mercy. Let us confess our sin before our merciful and healing God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we often fail to be obedient to your word. Forgive us for the things we forget to do. We don't always do your will, and we often are not good stewards of your love. We often do not love our neighbors as ourselves, and do not always hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and fill us with joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God's healing mercy abounds. God's grace goes before us, after us, through us, sometimes unbeknownst to us. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. We are forgiven and restored to right paths of justice and shalom. Thanks be to God. Now Chris Anderson will read from the New Testament. Good morning. Good morning. I'm reading uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through the first part of 8, and I'll be reading in three different uh, translations. This is from the New International. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And from the new living. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love gives up, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And finally, from the King James, the new King James, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to take off my mask because I'm double vaccinated and so you can hear me a little better. So I want to keep you safe and if I get real rambunctious, I'll take a few steps back for you all in the first couple of rows. <laughs> what a joy to be with you after a year of you enduring my talking head. My apologies. <laughs> for Valentine's Day, I wanted to surprise you all with warm cookies and the snow had other intent for us. so as has happened for us many times this year. Things that we plan don't go as we plan. But here we are together and we're moving forward and there is actually hope beaming toward us. Like the last few days when 
the sun was so glorious and I couldn't believe that maybe, maybe things will start to be different. So much so that I planted 250 bulbs in my yard. My hands are blistered and my shoulders are killing me. <laughs> so as with many things, I got a little carried away yesterday. <laughs> but even though this is my first time here in your absolutely gorgeous church, we have a connection. Um, one of the young men that I mentored when I was pastor in a church in Fife, Milton area, was Steve Klump's son, Matt, who grew up in this church. And I was one of the people that presided with Steve at Matt and Allison's wedding. So I have that um, relationship with family of your family. So in some ways we're cousins. And we have this relationship where we get to be together now at the family reunion. And so I am really happy to be here and to talk again about the nuances of love. Because it seems to me that there are so many definitions of love being battered about that we have forgotten that the most beautiful, complete, and in some ways highest standard for us is right in this passage. And so it bears us hearing it in different translations and in different ways to show us kind of how far off we are of the standard. And so I wanna talk about the second part of this text and more about love. And special shout out to Marilyn being here in church. I'm so glad she's here. <laughs> it always is more fun when there's a kid in church, so. Thank under you. The pew right now. Perfect. That's where all kids should be under the pews. <laughs> so when we we start to think about the essence of love, it starts right out with saying love is patient and kind, which is the sermon I sent to you on Valentine's Day, and it's a spot we have to return to again and again. What is the very first thing they say about love? Love is patient. Are we patient? No. <laughs> it takes a lot to get us to where we're patient, right? that we have to have many days and opportunities to practice before we achieve patience. Because we are a community where um, as humans, we can be weird and broken and lonely and scared and ornery and loud. And sometimes we chew with our mouths open. Sometimes I chew with my mouth open. I have a deviated septum, it's hard to breathe through my nose. <laughs> It's not an excuse, it's just that I like to breathe and so sometimes there's a problem. I don't do it to annoy people, I do it because it's sometimes difficult. <laughs> and like me, we all have things that are difficult for us, that maybe annoy other people. Many of you have spent the last month in the house, maybe with someone who annoyed you a little bit after a few days, or you were annoyed because there wasn't anybody to annoy you. Kindness is kind of a big deal. And so I think that's why the definition when starting with kindness reminds us that kindness is a life changer. It's a community changer and it's a world changer. I often think that almost every single problem we face as humans can be solved if we were just kind. But it goes on. Um, in our world today, we probably have had more assaults to kindness than I've ever experienced in my 57 years. And one of the metaphors that I saw recently that I loved were these two dogs on the other side of a fence. And the dogs were growling and like charging and knocking their bodies into the fence. And then the person removed the fence and the dogs were very calm and they sniffed each other and they wagged their tails and they put the fence back and they were right back trying to kill each other. And the caption was, life with the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. <laughs> that when we have that fence of not seeing someone face to face, our communication has gotten a whole lot nastier. And so kindness, again, is like the great elixir to what's going on in our world. This Lent, I'm looking personally in what it means to love. As we walk into the season of the cross, we follow the shadow of the great sacrifice of Jesus who took human form, living as one of us, living perfectly, and then laying down his life to barter for our souls. As we walk to Lent, we're walking in the path of the greatest love humanity has ever experienced. So it is important for us to think about what this love means for us. Not only to feel love, because for many of us, our grumpiness comes out of the fact that we don't feel we're lovable. We don't love ourselves. 
Never mind trying to reach out and love other people. And so when we think about what Christ has done for us, I hope we think about how worthy or gifted we are because of his sacrifice. We are worth love. We are lovable. And this passage reminds us that the love goes both ways. When the passage says love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, I wonder, really, what does it mean to bear all things? And that's why my title is Love is a Bear. On the way here, I saw three bears. Not real bears, bears on trucks, bears on signs. I also saw a Yeti on the way into town, a Squatch. Four eagles flew over me. And I thought, you pay attention when you see a bear, don't you? So let's talk about the bear in the room. What does it look like to bear all things? Does it mean carrying the world on your shoulders, like the mighty Atlas? Does it mean putting up with other people's rude behavior? Does it mean letting things go? Does it mean ex ignoring the mistakes of others? Does it mean forget about it? That's my favorite New York phrase. <laughs> maybe, maybe it means those things sometimes, possibly, but I think there's a lot more to it. I wanna explore what it means to bear all things. A bear is a giant, powerful animal. And if we allow it and this pun to get some legs, I want to ask, what does it mean to bear each other's burdens? And sometimes it's easier to describe what something is by describing what it isn't. So let's think about what a bear is and what a bear isn't. A bear is not a moose, although both are big and brown and powerful. And a moose will kill you faster than a bear, if you didn't know that. A bear is not a rug, although I've stepped on a few. A bear is not a boxer, but I've seen a man in a bear box. A bear is not a pet, although I have known someone who lived with a bear. What is it to bear all things? Well, it's not snapping when things go wrong. Like when your driver takes a wrong turn. When things don't go as you expect. When your car won't start because someone in your family forgot to get gas. It's not being angry when the firebox is low because someone forgot to chop wood. It's not throwing a fit when someone is late. It's not being impatient or pouting. It's not when you're arguing, bringing up everything that ever went wrong in your relationship. It's not snapping at each other. It's not yelling at traffic. It's not thinking the world is out to get you and that you have to be on the defensive in order to survive. It's not complaining about people in your church or your neighborhood or your workplace or the world. It's also not about being abused. I really think that's important to highlight because people have often tended to use scripture to harm each other. It's strange, isn't it, how we can use the sacrifice of Jesus to try to control and manipulate others. That is not what bearing all things means. Bearing seems to have something to do with patience, which is how the passage starts. Love is a non-reactionary way to engage with someone else. We don't fly off the handle. And that takes practice, especially when we're raised in a home where anger was a sibling that was always present. If we saw people in our homes yelling when we were kids, fighting, raging, we believe deep down that that's normal. If we saw people calmly reasoning, well, then we had a head start. But the beginning is not the end of the story. Even if your upbringing was rough, very rough by today's standards, the wonder of human experience is that we can relearn and we can grow. We can change. We do change. Why do we lose patience with each other? Sometimes I think it's because we're afraid. Fear can often be um, something that makes us react because we are afraid that something bad's going to happen. I admit that I yell occasionally in my car. 
<laughs> Not that the other driver can hear me, but it's mostly because I'm scared. Like when someone cuts you off, you're like, oh, what are you doing? And that's because I'm an artist and I have a really creative brain. So I can picture all the stuff that could happen bad. <laughs> it's kind of like the superpower of all mothers. They can imagine every terrible thing that could happen. And fear jumpstarts our survival responses. So it takes practice to think about what we can change inside the car instead of outside it. Could I drive slower? Yes. Could I drive more defensively? Absolutely. Could I drive with fewer distractions? Yes. Those are the things I can control. And if I'm doing those things, I'm way less likely to yell at what someone else does. So I'm kind of ready for it. Do you know the phrase, keep calm and carry on? Do you know the origin of that phrase? So during the Blitz, when Germany tried to break the courage of the British people, they decided to bomb London every single day for 57 days. And not only London, but all the major manufacturing cities in England. They knew that if they did this Blitz or this lightning war, they would break the spirits of the people and they would surrender. It's what Germany counted on. But something very strange happened. The king, who was a man who stuttered, was able to get his speech and encourage his people to be brave. And they came up with the phrase, keep calm and carry on. This is when bombs are coming down on them. This isn't just the little things that happen to us that are annoyances. This is when the buildings are blowing up. And they're keeping calm and they're going to work and they're making their supper and they're having their tea and they are being bombed. <laughs> Think about that when you are tending to fly off the handle <laughs> on what we have to endure compared to what others have endured. Not to feel guilty about it, but to kind of step up to the plate. Like, yeah, we're sick of COVID. Amen? Amen. We're sick of masks, right? Yes. We're sick of not being able to hug each other. No. And this too will pass. It's important to remember that if we're having a hard time, other people are having a hard time too. And we can cue into our empathy. You know, when we bear each other, we can take a little snarkiness for each, from each other if we're in relationship of love. When I was preparing for this sermon today, I got out a book from my youngest daughter, who our two daughters live with us because of COVID, even though they're adults which has been a really wonderful time in so many ways. But one of them asked for a book, so I went into the library, fished it out, and in the book, I found two letters from my second year of pastoring in 1991. And I kept these letters because they were to remind me of what it's like to be a pastor. March 29th, 91. Dear Ms. Klein, spelled wrong, I don't know who you thought you were inspiring today, but using your big words and erudition didn't work for us. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I died laughing when I read this. No signature. Anonymous. This is what it's like to be a pastor. <laughs> I kept another one. Addressed to El Pastoral at the Presbyterian Church. Again, misspellings. You can see I'm a little anal about that. <laughs> Only in quotes, one thing, no signature. Liturgy is the last result of a religious scoundrel. <laughs> oh, oh, I think these are so funny. I don't know if I thought they were funny 30 years ago. <laughs> when I was 26 and I read these, I probably was like, <gasps> but because I kept them, I must have had some reason for keeping them. And what I think the reason is, is to remind us that no matter what we're doing, even if we're doing it well, there's somebody that's not going to like it. <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay if not everybody likes what you're doing, if you're doing the thing that God has called you to do. Because remember, we're not here to please humankind. We're here to please God. And God is pleased by our kindness and are tolerating each other. Even when the whole world is sending anonymous letters, 
That's not supposed to be us. And why? Is it because we're extra strong? That we've done the COVID push-ups? That we've been really fit? No, it's not by our strength. It's not by our practice. Although our practice helps what Christ has already done for us, helps us live into it. But we do these things because we've been fully and completely loved and accepted. And when you have that kind of self-assurance, of knowing that the God of all creation reached out his arms on a cross to enfold you, then you can be more gracious to others. Because you know, you know that everything you will ever really, really need has already been given to you. And that's love. God loves you. Imperfect, weird, funny, you. When we live out of that, everything is different. We've had a season where things have been rough. Sometimes I wonder what our witness is called to be. But I know that we're supposed to love each other. We're never given a, a passage that says, love each other, except in this situation, like when you're waiting in the line for the DMV. Like, that's, that's not a passage in the scripture. <laughs> so how do we bear all things? How do we love each other? Well, there are a few things that will help us bear up. Some practical things that I want to give you. And the first is gratitude. When we start the day being grateful for what we have, even if it's just a little morsel, we've changed our brain and we've changed our heart. So I want to encourage you, if things are tough for you, if you're having a hard time bearing up under all this, to start and end your day with a practice of gratitude. It only needs to take a few minutes, but just counting your blessings, being grateful that you were able to get out of bed, being grateful that if you weren't able to get out of bed, that you could pray for someone from your bed, being grateful that a beam of light came into your room, being grateful that we've had enough to eat. That gratitude will change your experience of your everyday life. And so in order to bear up, to bear with each other. We need to be grateful for each other. So too does this happen to make our relationships better. If we think about the friends and people in our life and count the gratitude we have for them, for who they are to us, for what they do for us, that also helps our relationship. Because then, rather than looking at scarcity, what we don't have, what they don't have, what they do that annoys us, we are instead turning our vision to what's good, what's kind. We're bearing each other up because we're seeing and calling out the good in each other. That changes our relationships. And that's something we have the power to train our brain to do. The amazing thing about our brain is we actually can change it by how we think. And if you're trying to change your brain and you're trying to focus on gratitude and you get distracted, that's okay. Just keep bringing it back. I'm thinking about what I'm grateful for. Oh, I gotta feed the dog. That's okay. I'm thinking what I'm grateful for. Oh my gosh, the phone's ringing. That's okay. I'm thinking what I'm grateful for. You do it gently and you keep returning to those things that bring you life. The second thing that really helps us to bear each other up and to bear whatever we're going through is to be present in the moment. Many of us either live in the past or in the future. If you live in the past, you can be a little grumpy about the present. And if you live in the future, you can be a little worried about the present. How do we start to live right where we are right now? To pay attention to what's happening right at this moment. That too takes practice. But you know what happens when you practice living in the present to keep turning your attention to what's going on right now? you increase your capacity for happiness in your brain. Documented with MRIs. When you start living in the present, you get happier. Because what's the present? It's a gift, it's a present. 
<laughs> the present is a gift. When we live in the present, we start to live better. Right here, right now. The third thing we can do to help bear each other up is we can start to serve each other with little ways. That sometimes we shut down when things get hard. When things get hard, we tend to silo, we get in our igloo, we don't want to get out. But when we do just a little act of kindness to someone else, that they say is the fastest way out of depression. Unless you need chemical support, which is very valid. But there's something that sparks in us when we do a little something for someone else. And I'm talking about small things. Little small things make our days better. Opening the door for someone, smiling at someone, buying coffee for someone behind you in line if you're going through the drive-thru. Just little things change your experience of life and enable you to bear up. Bearing all things, oh, it can seem like a lot if we look at the bear, to go back to my pun. Because a, a great big bear is difficult to get your arms around. There's teeth, they may not like hugs, but bearing is in us asking to get bit. It's not telling other people how to bear up. Do you see what we do a lot of times as Christians? We hear a sermon and we're like, oh my gosh, John needs to hear this. <laughs> oh, that sermon today, I wish Tom or Judy or Mary or whomever would have been in church today. They really needed to hear this. And that's very generous of us. But that also may have us miss what we needed to hear about the message. So, what do we need to do? Let's pick out that little log in our eye before we try to get someone else's splinter. The point is, the greatest commandment is clearly to love God and to love each other. And many in our world have chosen to write that commandment off. To love each other is to bear each other. Love isn't a bully. Love is a savior. Love is a gracious God who meets us right where we are and is kind. And love is a verb, as I've said before. It's what we do. I want to go back to the bear because there's nothing that jerks you into the present like a bear. And I've had many, 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 many encounters with bears over my lives. Not on signs, or, but real bears. Real true bears. I rode at Fort Lewis for years and we would see a bear every day of spring. Because the mama would come into the orchard where the apple trees were and she'd send up her babies and feed them and we'd watch at a safe distance. My dogs even learned to stay back. My horses learned that the bears were okay. And a few times I was within two or three feet of a bear. And so I learned not to fear bears, <laughs> which is probably not a good thing. But there was a time when my life stopped. We were in Yellowstone, we had our kids on horseback. My little three-year-old was on her own horse because she insisted. And my knees were sore, so I got off to walk ahead. And over this ridge was the biggest grizzly bear I've ever seen in my life. I bet it was 2,500 pounds an enormous bear. And as I came over the ridge, he looked right at me and all I could see was what was gonna happen. The bear was gonna charge, my daughter's horse was gonna bolt, she was gonna fall off and she was gonna be his chicken nugget lunch. And so I looked at that bear and I said, hello bear, what a nice bear. I'm so glad you're here bear. <laughs> and I talked to that bear for 20 minutes while I was able to get back around where the horses were and get them around that bear. And that was the grace of God, but in that moment, I was fully alive. Because <laughs> a bear gets your attention. But the original word for bear in this passage isn't bear, like an animal. It's stege, which means roof. So to bear all things is to put a roof over it, to give it shelter, to give each other shelter, to take care of each other, to create this beautiful household, like this beautiful church, where there's a safe place for each other. And that's what I want you to leave with today, that to bear all things is to provide safety for each other, 
to listen to those stories that are so painful that you're afraid of being judged when you share. But when someone receives them with love, heals them. To be open to each other and honest with each other. Because if you love each other honestly, this becomes a sanctuary, a true sanctuary where people are safe. So bearing all things, what does it mean? To trust, to accept, to embrace, to shelter, to comfort, to provide a place from the storm. There's so much about safety in it. So much about covering. Are we loving each other? A good question for a church to ask. Are we protecting each other? Are we keeping each other warm and dry? In conversation, when it turns a little snarky, how do you respond? Do you defend each other like a roof? Do we protect? How can we protect each other in these days? It's amazing this phone we have. Thank you, Alexander Graham Bell and everyone else that invented it. We can actually see each other on our phones right now. How amazing is it? But sometimes when we're sheltered, we forget to reach out. So bearing each other is checking in on each other, providing that safe place, remembering that we do this because Christ has already provided a house for us. The very first passage I memorized in kindergarten was, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a safe place for you. It's that shelter that God provides for us and that God in turn calls us to provide for others. It's not just to stay warm and dry ourselves, but it's to help others who are out in the storms. And so Toledo, I want to encourage you to think about your community this week. Who out there need some sort of touch. Maybe not physical touch, unless it's the elbow bump, but some sort of interaction or connection. How can we be kind to those in our community? How can we be kind to those in our neighborhood? How can we bear each other up? That's our call and our privilege, because there's nothing that makes a human more human than reaching out and loving others. So I pray that that will be your homework for this week, thinking about the bears in your neighborhood. Amen. 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 If anybody needs a little encouragement this week, I did do a little painting of a bear, which I thought would be a fun reminder, and it says, love bears all things. So I want you to self-select who needs that. And if you, anybody's grieving, I also brought some little flower note cards because sometimes we just need a little something tangible to get through whatever's going on this week. So don't let these stay in this church. Someone needs to take them out today. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Well, following that subject, I'm here to do a minute for mission. And you know what time of year it is now, it's March, and this is the one great hour of sharing time. Around the world, millions of people lack access to sustain, sustainable food, clean water, sanitation, education, and opportunity. The three programs supported by one great hour of sharing are the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, Presbyterian Hunger Program, and self-development of people. And they all work in different ways to serve individual and communities in need. Receive, uh, received during the season of Lent, each gift to one great hour of sharing helps to improve the lives of people in these challenging situations. The offering provides us a way to share God's love with our neighbors in need. <clears throat> in fact, the one great hour of sharing is the single largest way that Presbyterians come together every year to work for a better world. This year we have the special envelopes 
on the back table. They're not in the pews because of COVID, but uh, if I'd encourage people to pick them up on the way home and bring them back sometime in the next two weeks. We'll take the offering or finish the offering on Palm Sunday, which is just two weeks from now. <clears throat> um, in the first half of this year, uh, uh, the uh, Presbyterian program uh, granted $4.1 million as 487 grants in the U.S. and 57 other countries. And this is despite COVID going on and virtual planning and meetings having to take place. Of that, about half of that money was for COVID-related responses. So it's been a very different year worldwide, of course. Um, let me share one story. Because water is life. When Manuel Nazario casts his net into the water these days, his catch is far less than plentiful. In the remote area of Bolivia, near the Paraguay-Argentine border, Manuel and the members of his indigenous community are finding that fishing, which is their traditional livelihood, is now in severe jeopardy. The Caprandita community is grappling with the devastating impact of climate change, irregular rainfall patterns, prolonged droughts, disease, and mining pollution. As a result, their age-old ways of life and their means of economic support are increasingly threatened. The degradation of the environment and the mounting lack of access to water threatens their very survival. Uh, Manuel has emerged as one of the leaders in his fishing community. A born innovator and community organizer, he is now leading the families of his area towards the promise of a better way in partnership with the local, or local organization, which is supported by the Presbyterian funds. Together, they are working to develop irrigation systems and to collect and store rainwater for individual families for safe drinking. Because the gifts received through one hour of sharing, like the gifts you and I will make to this offering, uh, the community organization is building infrastructure to address the community's critical water shortage. Their goal is to create 500 meters of pipes to transport safe well water to those in need. And Manuel will be res the responsible point person for carrying out the excavation work on the underground piping system. Our gifts will also um, support the distribution of large plastic containers to collect and save rainwater for families use. Uh, one great hour of sharing helps us address critical water needs like this and in places like South Sudan, training technicians to dig water wells for their communities and to maintain safely. In places in our country like Detroit, uh, <coughs> our gifts have joined We the People to secure access to water for a large number who had their water shut off during the pandemic. One great hour sharing is the single largest way that Presbyterians come together every year to share God's love by becoming repairers of the breach or repairers of the broken in our world. Together we are making a better world for those in need no matter where they are. Please give generously for when we all do a little it adds up a lot. Let us pray. Dear Lord, meet all the needs for which the world thirsts. May your spring of justice, compassion, and peace spring up quickly, and may it spring up quickly in us. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jen. And uh, uh, I have a note from the treasurer just reminding you that if you want to uh, uh, make a donation to One Great Hour of Sharing, just uh, uh, check out as usual to Toledo Presbyterian Church and make a note on the memo line, uh, One Great Hour of Sharing or OGHF, and, that and then that money will go for that mission. Um, if you're able to, will you stand please? The earth is the Lord's 
and all that is in it. God has given us many good gifts and calls us to respond. Let us now give in return and let us now speak the doxology. Praise God from whom from all, all blessings flow. Praise, Praise him, him all, all creatures, creatures here, here below. below. Praise, Praise him, him above ye heavenly hosts. hosts. Praise, Praise Father, Father, Son, and, and Holy Ghost. Ghost. Amen. Amen. Glor uh, gracious God, accept what we offer today in the hope that it reflects the offering of our lives as dedicated to you and your service. Bless all that we offer so that it might serve you in this church and in our world. Amen. Amen. Lead us in our joys and concerns, and then Diane Geister will read the prayers of the people and lead us in the Lord's Prayer. As we bow our heads in prayer, we lift up all of the prayers and praises that were spoken and unspoken here today. God of Lent, help us as we continue our journey to the cross and resurrection. Help us to discern the crosses that litter the landscape of our lives and your world. Enable us to see your resurrecting power always and already <laughs> at work in the broken places of our lives and your world. Empower us to step into those places where we can participate in your work of bringing life out of the dark places of our world. And we pray for the world, especially for those places where evil is wreaking, wreaking havoc upon human lives and the life of your creation. We pray for every human on earth dealing with the devastation and chaos caused by the pandemic. We pray for those in our own country, our own state, our own county, our own community, and within our own families and congregation who have lost jobs, health care, stability, and their lives during this relentless pandemic. Help us to serve as agents of your love and care to those who are suffering. And we pray for wise discernment by our nation's leadership as they negotiate ways in which to aid those most afflicted. God, you have called us to be Church of Jesus Christ in this time and place. Keep us faithful to that calling. Help us love one another, and by so doing, to be a witness to our world of what it means to be disciples of Jesus. On our journeys, enable us to hear Jesus' commandment to love even those we perceive as enemies. Empower us by your love to see each other as your beloved. Enable us also to see that we are all sinners and saints who are equal recipients of your magnificent love. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you rise as we continue the benediction that we've so beautifully been given? Do tifka andion ansin kram. May the roof above you never fall in, and may your friends gathered below it never fall out. In the Irish, slancha. Amen. Amen. Amen.